Well, thank you, Dale, and uh, good evening and welcome um, to the 50th annual Right to Life Conference. Uh, it's great for me to be with you this evening, and um, I got back into town this afternoon, uh, and my wife, Kimberly, who is with me here tonight, and I uh, do an annual family photo with our kids and grandkids. And so we uh, embarked on that a little earlier, which kind of explains my, my dress code here. I get told what to wear, um, and I don't dispute it. I just put it on. But, uh, but anyway, uh, if you can imagine, we've got five grandkids now. They're all five and under, five, four, three, two, one. Um, it's a little chaotic trying to get people to sit long enough. And so there's a lot of Photoshopping, I think, in the end that probably gets done to make that picture look like it should. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an honor for us to be with you this evening, to thank you for everything that you do to advocate on behalf of life, not only here in South Dakota, but across the country. Um, Kimberly and I live just a few blocks west of here. We've lived in that house now for 23 years. Um, our daughters both attended Roosevelt High School right over here. I've got a brother who lives just down the street from me. She has a brother who lives just down the street from us, and their kids, my three um, nephews, all went to Roosevelt High School, and I've been here at First Church a, a few times through the years as well, and so um, we're grateful for the opportunity to be with all of you this evening and to thank you and to encourage you uh, in the work that you are doing. It is, a, it, is, it is such an important work, and, you know, it breaks my heart that in this neighborhood also we have the representative of the abortion industry just down the street. And it always warms my heart when I see, when I drive by there and I see people out there standing up for life. But I will tell you that uh, that fight never stops. And I think anybody who has been around um, this for very long realizes how deeply entrenched the opposition is and how visceral it is for them. And, and they will do anything they can to try and extinguish life in the womb. And you're seeing that right now played out on the national stage again. We have in Washington, D.C. right now, there's a big debate going on about legislation and uh, it's stuff that uh, I hope never, we're gonna do everything we can to, to stop right now. Um, but, but there is, but in every, Every piece of legislation that comes across the floor of the House or the Senate right now, uh, there is an attempt by the other side to do away with Mexico City, which prevents our tax dollars being used for abortions uh, in foreign countries. And there is always an attempt to do away with the Hyde protections um, that make sure that no tax dollars in this country are used in support of abortions. Um, and interestingly enough, there was a, a bunch of stories this week about this big spending bill, this massive spending bill, like it's coming down the pike, um, and they were talking about the size of it and what's in it and all that, all of which is awful. But something that kind of got missed, I think, by the media is one Democrat uh, stepped up and said, Joe Manchin stepped up and said, uh, I am not going to vote for anything that doesn't have the Hyde protections included in it. And that's, I hate to... Um, and, I, and unfortunately, there aren't many of them left uh, on the other side. But that is a huge, huge statement because the, the Senate, as you know right now, is 50-50. It is evenly divided. And the vice president cast the deciding vote. The procedure that they're using to pass this big spending bill can be done at 51 votes. And so having a Democrat get up and say, I won't vote for a bill that doesn't have the Hyde protections in it is a big, big deal and oftentimes doesn't get reported by the media because that's not what they're paying attention to. But that's a big development. The one thing I guess I will tell you, in all the years that we've been involved in these fights, and there are 15 now, I think, pieces of legislation in the United States Senate that are designed to protect life. Um, there is the Pain-Capable Unborn Protection Act, which uh, it, you know protects, basically bans abortions after 20 weeks. Um, there is the... Um, uh, Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which we got a vote on in the Senate not too long ago. It's a bill that Ben Sass from Nebraska authored. We're always looking for opportunities to move pro-life legislation in the Senate. We don't have the votes to succeed and win in most cases, but the one thing that we have been able to do in the past few years is get a bunch of good judges on the courts. 
And, and I can tell you, I know people, people in this country, and I know a lot of our, our, our base and the people who work so hard on the pro-life cause through the years get frustrated that not, not enough happens in Washington, and things happen very, very slowly in Washington, uh, granted. But the one thing that your involvement and efforts have made a difference on is the effort to elect the right people, both to the White House and the United States Senate, to make sure that we can get good constitutionalist judges on the Supreme Court. And all these last four or five years that I've been in the Senate, in the last several years now, I have to get the votes on the Republican side. That's my job. Um, you know, we've been working to move systematically. Our, our model has been no, leave no judicial vacancy behind. And as long as we had the opportunity when President Trump was in the White House and we had the majority of the United States Senate, we got through there about 200, 200 federal judges, both lower court, appellate court, and of course the three Supreme Court justices. But the one thing, the one thing that will make a profound, profound difference in the fight for life in this country is continuing at the grassroots level to keep that momentum going. And there are lots of state legislators I've seen in the room tonight who are heroes and champions of the pro-life cause here in South Dakota, and some that aren't with us, guys like Roger Hunt, who fought these battles many, many years ago. I've known Roger for a really long time. But there, it starts there. It starts with people who care enough and are committed enough and passionate enough to be willing to roll up their sleeves and go to work and try and make a difference and get the right people in the right positions to move the ball in the right direction and, and bend, that, bend that arc in, of history in the direction of life. And I thank you for doing that. Um, I know when these last three Supreme Court justices came before the United States Senate, they were, you know, these are, these are hard, tumultuous, um, hard-fought confirmation processes. You guys all watched it. You watched it. Everybody watched it. And this last time, and last fall, when uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett came before the United States Senate and I had my uh, meeting with her, I had written out, I had scribbled out a verse. Uh, I handed it to her, and it was from Isaiah 54, 17. It says, no weapon formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that accuses you in judgment you will condemn because that is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and I will vindicate you, says the Lord. And I just knew that she was going through that process. She was going to get beat up and challenged at every turn, and I can tell you watching her as she endured that, I really felt I could see um, the presence of the Lord. And it's important to remember that no weapon formed against us will prosper if we're in there fighting for the right things. And I was delighted to see her get confirmed, and it wasn't easy. And you go back to uh, Judge Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch, uh, 2016, you know, it was a tough decision at the time. We made the decision in the last uh, year of the Obama administration not to fill the Scalia vacancy. And the media beat us up. The Democrats beat us up. Um, but I'll tell you what now, folks, we actually have the right court for this time, for this season. And when they hear this, when they hear this, um, when they hear this Dobbs case, and they're going to start hearing oral arguments next month, and that'll probably, they'll probably decide it next summer. And I don't know what they're going to decide, but I know there are the right people in place now that we have an opportunity to see for the first time in a long time real progress made in starting to undo Roe versus Wade once and for all. So there will be a day, there will be a day, and I hope it's, you know, I hope I, love to, I live to see it, where all lives in this country, born and unborn, are protected. And as long as uh, God gives me breath, and I hope as long as everybody in this room, as he gives you breath, that we'll continue in that labor and that fight together. Because it is, it is a, a fight for the ages. It's a fight for justice. It's a fight for righteousness. And it's a fight for what God has placed as a conviction, I think, in the, every human heart, no matter which side of this issue you're on, even the people who are opposed to this have got to know deep in their hearts. Uh, just as the um, prophet Jeremiah said, that he said that uh, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God said this to him, 
I consecrated you before you were born, and I have designated you, appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And I've been reading a lot uh, of late in Jeremiah and Isaiah um, because I think it kind of fits the times that we're in. But those prophets and those prophecies at that time, uh, it, one of the very verses that we use when we talk about the recognition by God of life in the womb. And uh, Jeremiah talks about it, David talks about it in the Psalms, it's throughout the scriptures. It is, it is a God-given right to life, which our founders recognized in that profound statement of self-government in our Declaration of Independence. But it's up to us to preserve it for future generations and do everything we can to see that it's protected in law, in our policies, in our attitudes, in our lives, in the way that we treat others. Um, he's given us life and breath. We need to use it for him, uh, for his kingdom purposes. And uh, one of those purposes is to make sure that we protect and fight for every human life. Thank you for what you do. Um, may God bless you for your work. And he may he continue to bless this country where we are so um, endowed with these freedoms that um, nobody else experiences anywhere else in the world. You know, I, Ronald Reagan used to say that uh, freedom is always only one generation removed from extinction. It can't be passed on in the bloodstream. It has to be fought for and defended and handed down for our children to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and grandchildren what it was once like to live in the United States of America where men were free. Those freedoms were fought for. Every generation has to do it. And um, it's up to us to do our part. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks, Dale.